Ecclesiastes 1, starting in verse 1. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does anyone gain by all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes to the north and around and around goes the wind on its circuit, the winds return. And the streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they flow again and again. All things are full of weariness. No one can utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is the word of the Lord. So, I don't know if anyone saw the graphic that um, Steve made for the emerging, um, uh, the emerging leaders series, but. There's a verse from um, Psalm 145 um, on it, and it's just in small little print. And it says, one generation will command your works to the next and will, will proclaim your mighty acts. So of course, I intentionally pick a poem to bring to you today that ends with a line that the people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of the people yet to come by those after them. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, this coincidence was realized uh, about three days ago um, whenever I saw the graphic um, again uh, come across. It's, it's a banner on your website if you want to go look at it. <laughs> um, but it, is, it does highlight something about Ecclesiastes that I really love and something maybe a little bit about my personality that I like too. Well, good morning, St. John's. It is good to be back with you. Um, some of you um, are familiar faces to me, and some of you are new, but I appreciate you letting me be here this morning with you. Although I did have the thought on the drive over here, I don't know that you let me be here with you. <laughs> um, I'm friends with Leah, and um, her and Steve are both out of town, so I really don't know how much choice you had over me being here. Um, but I am, I am happy to be with you all here. Um, I know for the past two weeks you have had my fellow classmates, or well, I should say past classmates, they both have graduated. I still have a year to go in my uh, Masters of Divinity, but you have added Laura and Alyssa, and now you have me, your third iteration of a late 20s white girl seminarian here today to talk to you about my call to ministry. <laughs> But could I be a little honest? Um, I don't know why I picked Ecclesiastes today uh, to talk to you about my vocation. It maybe was a little impulsive. I mean, I like poetry. I do really like Ecclesiastes and how it's reverberating against these other voices in our whole canon of scripture. But if I were to, if you were to ask me, you know, what do I want to do, what do I feel called to do in terms of a job, I would probably point to like a minor prophet. Um, I want to be able to call out um, injustices that are happening. Um, I have much more of a passion to call the church to the values that I think we've inherited in this tradition. Um, but I can't bring that to you. We, we don't have that kind of relationship. <laughs> um, I don't know what your growing edges are, and so I, um, I also, you, you don't know who I am, so what would a message like that come from me? So I didn't bring you Amos and tell you to like stop singing, um, which is what Amos tells the Israelites to do. Um, 
But I do think there's something in Ecclesiastes that is more of a human vocation of a call. And it's not so much that I feel like this is what I am doing, but more so the call I'm feeling just in my own spirit as I am a part of this like larger body of the church. And so I wondered maybe, maybe this would resonate with all of you as well in just what is it to be human. And so we're going to dig into Ecclesiastes, um, which has some wisdom to offer us on this human life. So, um, anybody else, like, really like Ecclesiastes? Show of hands. Okay, okay, this is, that's actually more than I was expecting. If we had two hands, that was going to be good. Um, there were, like, seven or eight hands for those of you who couldn't see. So, Ecclesiastes, um, if you're familiar, is in this genre of wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And within the wisdom literature genre, there are three main books um, that are each personifying a character type. So first you have this guy who just has so much loss and death and suffering for no apparent reason, and he just asks why God over and over and over again, and that's Job. Then you have Proverbs, who is like your first grade elementary school teacher who has really good one-liners that are going to be really helpful if you follow them. They're generalizations, though. They're like true 90% of the time, um, but they're really easy to pull out one at a time. They're quick little whips that you can remember. And then we have this jaded, brooding artist, like cynical philosophy professor type, and that's Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is there just to say, actually, Proverbs, it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes you raise your child in the way they should go, and they just don't go. Or actually, this suffering is completely unexplainable, and there's really no rhyme or reason in this scenario why this is happening. And so in these three character types, um, all of them are offering a different piece of wisdom, and none of them are complete until they're like put together. And that is essentially like what the Bible is and what our canon is, and it's, it's a call to like live in tension. Not, like, Authors aren't saying the same thing over and over again. There, like, there is a through line to it all, but people are coming at it from different perspectives, and our task is to sit with multiple voices all getting a seat at the table and feeling how, how does this tension come into play? Um, sometimes we lean on this voice over this voice, but also just how do we live in complexity, and that's humanity. Humanity is not simple enough to be cut by a surgical knife of this is over here and this one was clearly your fault, but we're this interconnected web. And so um, I anticipate you'll feel that tension maybe coming from me this morning because there are going to be times when Ecclesiastes says something and I want to rush in um, as the like minor prophet voice and be like, no, but this does matter. But this morning... Um, really, this is, this is just for me. This might not be for you. But it's just to let the invitation, or the invitation is just to have Ecclesiastes say its piece and let that be the focus for today. So, let's dig in. We have this opening line, vanity of vanities, or maybe you've heard it, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Now, vanity and meaningless are slightly incomplete translations of this Hebrew word hevel. There's just a little bit more that this word carries that our English language can't carry in one word at a time. Hevel is not just vanity, but it is also to become vain or to act emptily. So meaning, it could be something that was once meaningful, but it has now become meaningless for some reason. It can also be translated as a vapor or breath, 
which, which helps give us a helpful image that breath is something we know is around and we experience it, but we can't grasp it, we can't contain it. And vapor, like thinking of the fog or the dew in the morning, at some point it's going to go away and we can't control when that happens. And sometimes if um, you're out walking early in the morning and you leave for your walk in the fog and you come back and it's not foggy anymore, you might have not caught even when the fog left at some point on your walk. And this, this is Hevel, but really, the best image I can think of that captures Hevel was a video that the middle school boys made in my youth group growing up. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, like I know Leah takes y'all's youth on a retreat, um, like a mid-year retreat, we also did the same thing. And for the weekend, everybody had a challenge. So we were all given by, like, age group, a random item. You had to then come up with a product that this, like you're making an invention, and then you're also recording a commercial um, for whatever it is that you're now marketing. So the middle school boys had this completely ridiculous commercial, only the way that like middle school boys can make something ridiculous. And they were, their item was just a plastic water bottle. And I remember there being like multiple scenes in their commercial, um, and they did like win, by the way, which, sorry to any middle school boys in the room, but usually you guys don't win these kind of competitions. <laughs> um, but the one scene I do remember is they're all like working out in their host home's home gym, and they're all like huffing and puffing and out of breath, and then in comes one of the other guys with air in a bottle. And he's working out, and as soon as he gets out of breath, he drinks the air from the bottle, and then he's not out of breath anymore, and on and on. And, like, all the guys are like, oh, my gosh, I need this air in the bottle. Um, and I think there was, like, a jingle that they made with it, too. I it, was, it was truly impressive. But air in the bottle is the most hevel thing I can think of. It is taking something that is actually quite essential to life, air, and it is trying to contain it and trap it into something that is completely pointless, which is putting it in a bottle. And so this, um, this hevel, this meaninglessness, it isn't that life itself is meaningless, but it's that when we try to control or contain something, whether that be um, beauty, money, power, or love, or even like sunshine, anytime we try to contain it, it does become meaningless. It disappoints us in a way. It is that like our eyes can't hold all the beauty, our ears can't hold all the sound. And so the professor continues to go on um, in chapter five to make sure that we don't go too far to thinking that there's no point. He says, no, 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 I've tried it all. Um, he's a very, like, well-experienced person. And he said, actually, like, all of it becomes meaningless. Like, even hedonism. Like, I, I said, like, let's just do fun. That sounds good. And even fun became meaningless. And so he gets to chapter 5, and he actually gives a nod back to Proverbs. And he says, no, actually, like, your work, while I just said was meaningless a sentence ago, you should still do good work. It does matter, and you should still respect God, like fear the Lord. That is still a good thing. But if you think that this is something that you're going to be able to control your life and just like a magic bullet for no suffering or a straight way to the top of whatever career it is that you're seeking, you're going to be disappointed. It will become meaningless if that is now your goal. And so, okay, we're like talking with this professor of like, yeah, things are meaningless. We shouldn't maybe th take things too seriously. We shouldn't try to control them. And he says, well, yeah, because everybody just dies. Like, oh, well, okay. He says, yeah, I mean, I, I looked at everybody and everybody's fate is the same. Like the wise person dies, the fool dies. And sometimes it's like, you would think that this person who should live so long doesn't. Like, there's not a rhyme or reason, but death is the certainty. 
But that's not a problem. Because again, our goal doesn't have to be to be remembered. He makes sure to keep us really humble, and he's like, no, you're, like, you're going to be forgotten. What his call ends up being is a call to just presence. It's a call to look up from the book that we're seeking answers from. It's a call to look up from the calendar we're trying to fill. It's a call to look up from the bank account that we're trying to protect. He says, be present and remember what it's all for. Look up and see what beauty is around you. If you try to store up whatever it is that you're seeking or the beauty you come across, it will become meaningless. It will be like walking into a gym with air in the bottle and not realizing air is actually all around you. And being out of breath is very normal when you're working out. And so all the things that go for beauty also go for suffering. The call is not just a a call to recognize beauty around you, but it's also to be present to the suffering around you. It's about how do I show up to suffering without an answer? How do I show up to suffering and stand the pain? When we seek an answer, sometimes that gives us a distraction. A reason for why this has happened will help us numb the pain. And the professor just says, it's a part of life, don't be surprised. The professor does this thing of finding the earth as the grounding thing in any existential crisis. However, the professor and I live in pretty different eras. Most of the rhetoric I hear is actually that the earth is dying. And then this poem just starts to hit all kinds of different. Right? I mean, I, I hear stuff of we can expect 2 billion people to be displaced within the next century because ecosystems will be destroyed. And like, can you imagine that like our immigration system can't handle the people that we have right now? Add 2 billion people to that. And then we're like guaranteed politi- or violent political conflict is going to arise because resources gonna, are gonna be, gonna become so scarce. I mean, I'm sure there are you, many more of you who know more about environmental sciences than me, but living in a climate crisis and hearing a poem that the earth is gonna remain just brings out all of my climate anxiety. I become resistant to the professor's advice. No, like we need to change something, we need to do something, we need to fix something. But actually, if I can ground myself enough, if I can remember just watching a bird fly off to find food and bring it back to her young, like a rhythm for two hours straight on my porch, If I can see something and remember a whole world is spinning that I don't know about, that's sustaining, if I can calm down just a little bit, I might be able to hear the wisdom that the professor is offering even in a time of a climate crisis. So my friends often joke with me about how um, seriously I take sustainability and creating waste and whatnot. And I don't know if anybody else has climate anxiety. It's like kind of a trademark of my generation right now, but I'm sure others feel it as well. Um, But I don't know how these jokes came about because I don't make people do anything. Um, But actually the last time I was here and preaching, I asked Leah for some water during my sermon and she brought me back a mug with water and then instantly confessed that she just took the plastic like one single-use water bottle and poured it in the mug just so like I wouldn't see the water bottle. Um, I'm like, wow, I didn't know I was that fragile. <laughs> um, but usually all of these jokes come about and the punchline is my friend just trying to remind me like, what I do isn't going to save the earth. And I know that. I know that like single actions aren't going to fix everything. And that's where like Ecclesiastes comes in, is 
I still choose to compost my eggshells because seeing something that was like waste be turned into life is beautiful. Like that's the gospel. To be in sync with creation is good work, even if I'm not stopping this like catastrophic crisis from happening. Caring for creation for me is a way to just be present. When my anxiety runs and thinks that like somehow me composting my eggshells will actually change the world, like yeah, that's when I need Ecclesiastes to tell me no, like you've missed the forest for the trees. That's certainly good work, that end is good, but remember to be present to the moment. Don't try to store up the whole world just so we can live forever and forget like the beautiful ecosystem that we live in. In other words, seeking flourishing for all creation is not just so that we can live forever. It's so that we can see God and we can see each other and we can learn to be present. Now, I would not be surprised if many of you, if not most of you, are better at that than me. That you have learned something about this wisdom of being present that is so core to the human call. While Ecclesiastes is just one voice calling us to be present, we do remember, like, this is in tension with other voices, and so I think um, the passage for me that I want to constantly hold that intention with is the end vision and revelation of, like, Eden being restored on earth. And John writes this, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, of the Lamb, through the middle of the street, on either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees are the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. And so I hold this tension of presence, as well as like this is the beautiful vision we are working towards. It's not something that we have to achieve in our lifetimes. It's not something that everybody has to remember, but it will just be beautiful to walk towards that vision together. And so what our Christian tradition offers us is complexity. Today, I want to give us permission to hear the wisdom that just says, remember to be present. See the beautiful tree that's like right outside here. Accept that you can't control it all. I'm sorry you're suffering. Find beauty in the simple things. So let us remember our vocation of presence today. And in doing so, I think we will find something meaningful, even when everything else can feel completely meaningless. Thank you. God, grant us the courage to change the things we can, the serenity to accept the things we can't, and the wisdom to know the difference between. Amen.